So I made an assumption today that I don't need to explain like what is working out loud so much or even why it's important. Well, a little bit about that. Um, the bulk of what I want to talk about today, what I want to focus on, is how to spread it. All right, so I wanted to give you something that you could do at your firm, or for those of you who are consultants, to do with your customers, or for you at Microsoft, what you could do with your customers. Right. Okay. What I've, I've been here um, about a week and a half. Uh, over this trip, I'm seeing seven companies. And what's interesting to me, and it's really funny to see that many companies in such a short space, because they're all saying the same thing. Um, they're all saying, they're all saying, <laughs> sorry. They're all saying, it's funny because we did test this. Um, or we could, have, we could have a very tall person just hit the button when I say, uh, what they're all saying is, we need to, we need to change. Um, and they'll typically talk about IT. Uh, mm -hmm. as one of the elements of that change. Um, they'll typically talk about a strategy or management directives as part of that change. But what's missing from almost every company presentation I've been to is how do we change behavior at scale? Right, how do we change what 8,000 or 80,000 or 400,000 people do every day? So they all talk about this. Like this is what we have, this is how we run our projects. They all compare it to this, which is we're in silos and we, we don't want that anymore. We used to want that, but we don't want it anymore. What we want is more like this, which is just people being able to come together quickly over some shared interest or topic at work. And Kirsten talked about this, where is she on Facebook today? That in, instead of these kind of rigid organizational structures, we want to be able to quickly form and unformed networks of people who come together to get something done. Great. So I think most people in this room get the joke. Yep, that's what we want. We don't need to blow up the org chart. We don't need to wait for the future of work. We simply want people to find each other who are related to a goal, come together, and be willing to work together. Right, that's what we want. How do we get that? So as I talk to companies, I talk about how working out loud can be used in the service of that, of making that transition, of helping individuals change behavior in a way that, that goes with the grain of being a human being. Right? That isn't something imposed by someone, but that goes with the grain of being a human being. And all working out loud is, it is one part of a toolbox. So it's, it's not the next big thing, it's not the answer to everything, it's just, look, if you're trying to change how your company works, then you're gonna want your people to have what is a fundamental 21st century skill, to be able to find others related to their goal and work with them in some way. It's not a bag of tricks or secret technique. Uh, it's just conventional wisdom about relationships meets the internet. That's it. So if I heard one word at Bosch more than any others last week where I spent the week, it was, it's simple. It is simple. Um, the hard part is practicing it. Practicing it until it becomes habitual. The five elements, one of which, uh, thank you Ragnar, is a growth mindset. So a quick recap for people who may be a little bit new to it. You know, we're gonna allow at one point um, Kind of around 2008 or so, it was mostly about, hey, you want to you you make your work visible. You want to narrate what you're doing, you want to take your stuff, put it someplace other people can see it. And so my own experience was with enterprise social networks. Um, by the way, all of these cost a nickel. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> was with, I introduced an enterprise social network at Deutsche Bank, and I thought, wow, this is going to change everything. Like this really is like bringing the power of the internet inside the company, it's gonna change everything. And it did for about 4% of the people, <clears throat> right? Because very few people are comfortable with fuck up nights. Pardon my French. Very few people, like that's not where you start. That's not where anybody starts. 
is going to, you know, turning the dial of vulnerability to 11 is not where people start. So over time, I took this basic idea, which I believed in myself, but I, I saw that for, for almost everybody, we needed to, to make it more accessible and make it more human. And so gradually we came to this. Working Out Loud is at its core about relationships. That's the thing, that is the headline. Not a bunch of activity, not a bunch of tools, it's about relationships. And why? Because your access to knowledge and to opportunities is via other people. And we've known that for a long time. So for anyone who remembers the research about the strength of weak ties, it's through diverse networks that you get access to things that you don't already know about. It's just a fact. We also know that the best way to build relationships is based on generosity. But not because we're all good people, although I'm sure that you are, probably. It's because we're wired as social animals for reciprocity. And what I can do with this practice is to give to you, Fee, and to you, Maya, and to you, Lucas. But I don't have to keep score. I don't have to treat it like a transaction. I don't have to be fake and try and manipulate you. I can give small gifts freely given, and over the course of my network, they will also naturally be a benefit to me, and that's okay. I can, so I can authentically help other people at work, knowing that over the course of my network, they'll be a benefit to me. And that's what I mean by going with the grain of being a human being. Visible work helps. You can work out loud, over email and other channels. That's okay. I can certainly take what I'm doing, frame it as a contribution that might be helpful to other people, and deliver that over coffee. <coughs> That's okay. But when you use social channels, you amplify who you are and what you do, you extend your reach, and you expand the set of contributions you can make. So if it's about increasing the odds, you further increase the odds that you can come into contact with people and knowledge that will be helpful to you. The other two are about a mindset, and Ragnar talked about a growth mindset, um, which was based on research by Carol Dweck at my alma mater, Columbia, on having such a mindset means that you're more likely to, to try things, to be resilient in the face of setbacks, um, to focus on the learning as opposed to just the accomplishment. So you, you're more likely to try things with that kind of mindset. And lastly, it's purposeful. So what do I mean by that? Um, it doesn't have to be your one special purpose or mission, but it's enough of a goal that it orients who you're trying to deepen relationships with and what kinds of contributions you make. So this way you're just not all over the place. Having coffee with 50 people, tweeting, Snapchatting, Instagramming. Like not that that's necessarily bad, but it, it, <coughs> many people, it's just broad and shallow, and it doesn't lead anywhere. So if you're trying to get a workforce to change behavior, making it purposeful makes it more motivating for them. Um, behavior. So all of this, if you talk in a room, uh, most people are like, okay, you know, that kind of makes sense. But then they're going to go back to their desk and they're going to be sucked in by their environment and their habits into whatever they were doing yesterday. And that's why all of us in 2016 still work like it's 1995. And as good as Microsoft Outlook is, <coughs> uh, we overdo it. Okay, so we put together two concepts. Um, Kata uses this language at Bosch, which I think is very good. Working out is just a guided mastery program for networking and collaboration. Guided mastery simply being Small steps practiced over time with feedback at your own pace. That's Albert Bandura, a famous psychologist, and he would apply this simple kind of process to curing snake phobias and a wide range of things. So he took that small steps practiced over time with feedback at your own pace, and we coupled it with peer support. And what peer support gives you, particularly at work, is structure, shared accountability, and support. Because I could guarantee you at every one of your places, people are going to say, I'm too busy. I am too busy to develop a skill that my company wants. I am too busy to get better at what I do. 
I'm too busy to tap into other possibilities that might be more fulfilling for me because I'm busy. And they know that over time their career equity is going down, but they're too busy to stop um, or they're too afraid to think about it because they're not sure what to do. So we combine these two things, guided mastery and peer support, and created working out loud circles. Now circles are the thing. Right? So I, I'd love it if you know everybody on the planet had a working out loud book. Go for you show one. Um, but that's not going to change people. What's going to change people is actually the doing, the, the experiential learning, the social learning. That's what changes people. So if you're here and you're thinking about, hey, this is an interesting practice, or I want to spread it in my company, or I want to, it's not the presentations or the book or the blogs or whatever else there is. It's the circles that are the thing. They are a learning vehicle. Right? And in a circle, just ask yourself three questions in week one. What am I trying to do? It doesn't have to be a big goal. It's something you genuinely care about that you can make progress towards in 12 weeks. A circle, by the way, four to five people, you meet one hour a week. Four to five people, you meet one hour a week. And you ask yourself these questions. What's the goal that I care about that I can make progress towards in 12 weeks? Ideally, it's, uh, particularly in an organization, I want to get better at this, whatever your skill is. I want to learn more about something. I want to find other people like me at this big company. Right. Um, I'm unhappy doing what I'm doing. I want to explore something else. And your company would much rather you do that at their company, but then have you just be angry or upset and then looking for a place to leave. And then lastly, how can you contribute to other people to deepen the relationship, back to generosity? Except you don't start with, well, you write a blog, right? Or you don't start with, you expose the biggest mistake you ever made and you, you share that with people. You know, we, we tend to think quite narrowly in terms of the word contribution or what we have to offer other people. And what we want to start with in these circles is even more simple and easy and fundamental. There are circle guides for each week. Remember, small steps practiced over time with feedback and peer support. And the first contributions you make are as simple as recognition. You're someone related to my goal, perhaps? I see you have an online presence. I hit the follow button. It's trivial. E any, even the, the most cynical, afraid person might do that. But it moves the relationship from, he doesn't know I exist, to he may have seen my name. And then, now I'm doing something else. The fact that I've even framed a goal in terms of other people means that I'm paying attention. Right? And I may be using some of these tools for the first time to pay attention. So now I've, I, I can offer other gifts like, that's an interesting thing that you said. Retweet, thank you, like, right? Again, trivial contributions, but Recognition, appreciation, gratitude are universal. Everybody likes to get the point. Take the, take the topmost executive, and I'm sure you deal with these people all the time, <coughs> and they write something and people respond, even they are like, hey, how many, you know, how many people are paying attention to me? And conversely, if your executive hits a like button, that will send ripples throughout, right? Why? He's paying attention. He sees me, or she sees me. The guides walk you through simple steps over time. You don't stop there, but for some people, maybe that's, that's the progress they make in their person. Right? It just opens them up a little bit. Maybe they never blog, or have a YouTube channel, or tweet. It's okay. It's at your own pace. So there's no test at the end. There's no certificate of being a Workout Loud expert. But the, the steps can get bigger over time just to expose you to greater possibilities. So I'm in my eighth circle, not so much because I don't know what I wrote myself, but because as I go through the practice over and over with new people, new perspectives, I, I refine my own practice. And the structure and shared accountability help me execute and make me feel good while I do it. Okay, rest of the talk I want to walk through what you would do. 
right. So the first is, we talk a lot about this, um, just start. Like I purposely designed this method, in quotes, so that anybody anywhere could practice it and anybody anywhere could spread it. I wanted the barrier to entry to be zero, which means I uh, haven't read the book, I don't have any money, but I can download a free guide, get three or four people, and we go. Right. Um, I want you to simply begin. Here's an example. There's a woman, um, Vanessa North, who I did not know. And uh, she happens to work in the Australian tax office in Adelaide, in Australia. And um, she'd come across the blogs. And one day, she does this. That's me. <laughs> but I love about this picture. There's me, and there's a guy taking a picture of a picture of me <laughs> in Adelaide, Australia, which is just a miracle of what I do. Um, she had a work my lab talk. Nothing, I didn't do anything. And uh, she, there were 46 people in the room. And she said, hey, there's this thing. Um, and you can imagine what it might be like working in the Australian tax office. It's not exactly, you know, Google. Uh, and they show up, and she offered them, do you want to form the circles? Everybody in the room signed up. Right? Why? Because they're hungry for something more. Right? You just give me a chance. Uh, in fact, nine people outside of the room heard about it afterwards, and they signed up. So she had a 120% conversion rate. Um, and then, Vanessa plays, again, we, we don't talk to each other. Vanessa plays, I mean, we corresponded on Twitter once uh, she mentioned it. Uh, she just, like, is in touch with the first circle. She gets them set up. Um, she points them to the guides. This is a photograph of week one. They changed Twitter. I mean, she's grouped them, right? Uh, it's like a pebble in a pond, which a few more people hear about it. <coughs> And she spreads more circles. She's using public materials. Um, most of them don't have the book, uh, if any. Uh, and they start to get experience with it. So she could learn, like, is this something for us? How would it work? Now, now what happens? This is a pattern, by the way, that I've seen multiple times. Um, and so we're going to talk about a couple of different companies. But what happens next is that then the circles meet, and then we nurture them. And in this case, Vanessa would just check in. Hey, how's it going? That's kind of a best practice. Not, not, not heavyweight, very lightweight, but just if somebody's stuck, she just kind of points them in the right direction, or maybe two people can't make it anymore, she reforms them. I would talk to them. I got on the phone one night, um, and I talked to people in Adelaide in the tax office, and I just did a little Q&A. Uh, why? Because it, my goal is to spread this practice as far as I can. And uh, not everyone, you know, not everyone has a budget or is going <coughs> to work with me in some formal way. But the more people that spread it, like the better for everybody. And I learn from something. I learn something almost every time. So you little nurturing of circles. Um, here's here's what happens. Is one of the guys, Tom, who's in that picture. He says, and so in the check-in that she did, he he wrote this to her. I felt like I was in a house with no doors, no windows, and no one noticed my awesomeness. Now I'm out. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And that's why I do what I do, is because she just lit a fire in somebody whose fire had gone out. And if you're the Australian tax office, you had a zombie at work right, who now feels like a little bit switched on and hopeful. Mm -hmm. Um, here's uh, nurture, right? So nurture means, um, in this case, it's a Bosch photo. I love these people. I actually met them uh, last week, which was a thrill for me. <laughs> but it's like, hey, where's Circle 26? Right? And what happens in the nurturing phase is people start to self-identify as, hey, I really like this thing. Or it really helped me. So the guy on my left... Um, has some leadership position, his name's Peter, and he's turned into a vocal advocate at the company. And in fact, he was at the conference last week, um, and you know, 
it was very important that you had somebody at his level signaling to other people saying, it helped me and that it, it, it helps people around me. In a way that was, that was about work, right? This wasn't just work, this was just making his organization better. Um, here's someone from Cisco um, who says, hey, it's changed my approach in both my personal and professional life. And I don't mean this so much as testimonials as in this phase, again, it's just, it cost a nickel. You're just spreading some practice that's on the internet and people self-select. It's not the Liz Blumens of the world or the Tom in Australia or it might be, they want to do more. Well, what would more be? Like, now what do we do? What more? So, by the way, you could just keep doing this. You could just point people to the public material and kind of infect your organization with a very positive, helpful, generous, connected practice. And that would be good. Um, Federal Express, for example, took the public guides, put them on their intranet. Um, they did a little mini conference. Uh, they formed a bunch of circles, all without like exchange an email. Great, great. Um, or some companies are going to want to customize it. So they're going to say, "Look, um, nice, nice practice, but it talks about." Twitter and LinkedIn a lot, and maybe some of the examples are about leaving your job, and you know, we kind of like, could we, could we adapt it somehow? And the answer is, sure. So here's uh, a group I'm working with, no, not vegetables. I'm working with a group in the, of universities in the United States. And there are 15,000 people, it's called extension.org, and they're, they're funded by tax dollars to help their local constituents of these 70 universities leverage the knowledge inside the universities. So their mission is to take knowledge in the 70 universities and spread it. Except no one's ever heard of them. And in fact, they, at, at uh, a conference, they call themselves America's best kept secret. And not in a good way. Like they, they were being self-critical, like we, our mission is to reach out and we're not doing that and we don't know what to do. And so one of their um, missions, one of their interests, they'll do things like um, things around climate change, things around uh, pollinator health, um, food safety. So protecting or uh, securing the safety of the food supply chain. And that is a, people care about that, right? That's a noble purpose. And so they have a newsletter, they have a community of practice, and I'm sure some of you have community practice at work, probably on SharePoint, um, that serve largely as repositories, just like a, it's a place to go, but there's not a lot of there there necessarily. And in fact, in their case, they had multiple of them. So here they have this big national organization that cares about food safety, except they care about food safety in Pennsylvania, in Washington, in Connecticut, in New Jersey, in Maine, in Minnesota. And it's very much like the first slide, like that the welcome to concrete slide. Because all the people in Penn State, like maybe at Pennsylvania, they know each other, maybe, but think it's just like any other org chart. And the CEO is like, Kim, we just want people to know what everyone else is doing so that we can be more effective as a whole. So that the universities can know what all the universities know and leverage that, just like people at a Bosch might want to tap into the collective knowledge of Bosch or pick your company or telecom or Aon or any of the other companies I saw this week. Okay, so what they did, um, this is a, I went to their conference in San Antonio, and what we're doing is customizing materials for their particular goals and for their particular culture. And back to the circles as learning vehicles, um, we're simply encoding behaviors into the guides. So the exercises, those little steps, are just simple gateways to new behaviors, and we can decide what those are. And we can use examples, or think of it as intelligent defaults, that make sense for that particular context. So it might be, if I'm telecom, it might be referencing their social network that they use, right, instead of just Twitter and LinkedIn. And then just, you could still choose your, your goal, 
but we're just nudging people towards, if you're at Audi, hey, here's the tools you have at Audi, here are the kinds of goals you have at Audi, maybe, like your suggestions, here are people at Audi, like the pictures I showed, and then people are like, uh, okay, path of least resistance, like, I'll do that. But they have the perception <laughs> of control, and that can make all the difference. And then they have the time allotted and the structure to take those steps. Um, it's, it, I view it as this is all custom artwork produced by other people. Um, and I love that I, I get these kinds of things or I see them. So last week I saw a bunch of beautiful artwork. And, and it was uh, a sign for me of people making the practice their own. So you could think of step one, just begin, do just one, two, five circles. Step two, and these aren't necessarily linear, but they're kind of evolution. Step two is you nurture those, you, you find the linchpins in your organizations who care a bit more. Step three is, aha, we're gonna, we're gonna own this, we're gonna make it ours and adapt it. And then some people, some organizations, will want to scale it. Because it's great if we've helped 25 people, but if you've got 250,000, we've got a ways to go. So if I'm in learning and development and I want to scale this practice across the company, what do I do? And what you do is, um, one is you use the institution as a positive lever. And that's what Katarina did very well. I'm not going to talk a lot about Bosch because she's going to give her own view. But what I mean by that is, you use the earlier phases to collect real stories and data about how it's going. And she and her team did a, like a brilliant job of this. So at first, the experiment was, it was an experiment. And it was kind of an experiment that wasn't necessarily embraced, but it was an experiment. And then after a while, four, five, six months, you had feedback, data, and stories that you could show to somebody and say, well, here's what the experience is. And then, then people can, can bless it. Like, hey, this, is, this seems to be working. You can keep going. And what I meant uh, by using the institution as a positive lever is, well, now, um, if bosses make time, uh, one of the teams won an award, so I have the executive on stage handing a working out award. It's safe. Right? And now more people can do it. And what we do, here's, the, here's how I, here's what I do. Um, and here's how I make a living, is, uh, and this isn't a commercial because I'm working with only a handful of people that I'm going to actually work with. But for people who get to this stage, you take those linchpins that were self-selected, you customize the material for them, <coughs> and then you train the trainer, which is a very simple, common idea. You take 50 coaches, you break them into 10 circles, and you guide them through the process themselves so they experience what it's like to be in a circle. And we do that over six weeks. Um, and then we, we coach them. So we have a new coach's guide that we just developed um, in concert with Bosch. A new coach's guide. People, then these 50 people would go through that and not only would they experience it, but they would say, okay, what could possibly happen in a circle um, that could go wrong and they get the tips from me and the collective wisdom from our community on how to deal with it. So now you got 50 people who really can raise the average effectiveness of these peer support groups and then those 50 people each form another circle and get a second wave of support. So now you've reached 250 people and your organization, it's still a small number, but your organization has an internal capability that you could just continue to spread. You've got the materials that are customized, you've got 50 trained circle coaches, and you just keep going. That's how you scale. And all of those people can now, again, like pebbles in a pond, reach other people. Uh, the last phase, and again, these aren't linear, but the last phase um, would be to innovate. And um, this is a good segue to Kata, where we're doing work uh, on shared goals. So let's say that the goal is around food safety. It's how do we, um, or if it's a particular Bosch goal, how do we get a, use that circle structure and that learning vehicle before a common 
goal for all of us instead of us each picking our own, a common relationship. Um, and that's a, it's a different thing. Set, there's a set of trade-offs involved, but we rewrote a new set of guides specifically for teams. And then it's a program for executives that's not circle-based, but that at least um, gives them some structure and support so that they can signal these behaviors in their organization. The circles are in 20 countries, which is, which is cool. The latest one was Israel. But they're also in like a really wide range of companies. And why I, I these aren't testimonials. These are, just, these are just people who have publicly talked about, hey, we've got some circles in our group. Um, but what I like about the slide is the sheer range. So it, it just, it's not just for young people. It's not just for Americans. It's not just for people who are social media savvy. It's just for anybody who wants a little something more from work or life. And here's a practice that they can get. It. So for you, wherever you are, if you're a Deutsche Bank, <laughs> someplace, if you're a Daimler, if you're at NetMedia and you're working with clients on culture change, this is just one part of your program. Um, this is just one practice that can address the missing piece, which is behavior change at scale. So start. So you, you, at Deutsche Post, mm -hmm. you could be that guy who just says, yeah, you could be Vanessa North, kind of. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, you could be that guy who says, like, oh, I'm, yeah. um, I could be that guy who, who starts circles and then um, nurtures them and then you see where that change takes you. So with that, thank you very much. I'd love to hear what would help you or what might be a challenge for you. And then after the Q&A, we'll talk about what Kata's done, which again, is kind of mind-blowing what her and her team have been able to accomplish. But with that, thank you very much.